So thermodynamics is more than just the heat and energy in a chemical reaction. One of the issues we deal with in thermodynamics is will a reaction be spontaneous or not? Now we want to explain what we mean by spontaneous. So if I have some kind of reaction where I have my reactants, if those reactants I mix them together, they go ahead and react and make products. If they do that on its own, then the reaction is said to be spontaneous. Okay, of course, on its own, it does not need any driving force, external force, to keep that reaction going. So, for example, a car rusting is a classic example of a spontaneous reaction. We've got our steel, the iron is sitting outside, it gets exposed to the water and the oxygen and it just reacts on its own. We don't have to do anything to keep it rusting. Unfortunately, it just happens. Even a Bunsen burner burning is an example of a spontaneous reaction. Once you get that reaction going, the methane reacts with oxygen from the air and it just keeps going. I don't have to do anything to keep it going. Now you might say, oh, well, you needed to give it a spark to get it started. Okay, we had to give it that activation energy to get it going, but it is a spontaneous reaction. I don't have to keep adding sparks to keep it going. So that's what we mean by a spontaneous reaction. Now, of course, just because I mix things together doesn't mean that they're going to automatically react with each other. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. So why are some reactions spontaneous and other ones not? Well, it all boils down to stability. And if we think about stability in terms of energy, we have a chemical reaction. You can think about the energy that our reactants have and the re-energy that the products have. And in a lot of cases, we have a reaction like this, where this is an exothermic reaction, where in this case, we start out with these reactants, which have higher energy or higher enthalpy. And because they are, have higher energy and higher enthalpy, they're actually less stable. And so they react, and we end up with products which are lower in energy and enthalpy, which means we've ended up with something that's more stable. So it makes sense to think that, okay, yes, we have exothermic reactions. They tend to be favorable because we end up with things that are more stable. So we might think, oh, okay, well then all spontaneous reactions must be exothermic. Well, there's a couple examples where that's not true. Now here's a graph showing an endothermic reaction where we're starting with our reactants here and we have our products on this side and you can see in this graph here we would end up higher and we would end up less stable in terms of enthalpy. You know, does this actually happen ever spontaneously on its own? Well, I can definitely think of some examples where this happens. You may remember back in Chem 1, we took some barium hydroxide and some ammonium thiocyanate. We mixed them together in a baggie, and we passed the baggie around the room, and it felt really, really cold. Well, they were chemically reacting with each other, and of course, because it felt cold, that means it was absorbing energy. It was an example of an endothermic reaction, and that was spontaneous. We didn't have to do anything except mix the two things together in the baggie. So yes, there are spontaneous reactions that occur that are endothermic. Um, another example is to think about an ice cube. If I were to take an ice cube and sit on the table in this room, uh, as ice, it has um, less energy. It has to gain energy from the surroundings. It has to absorb energy to turn into liquid water. So that means when it's done, it's higher in energy. So that is an endothermic process. It had to gain energy to melt. Well, that happens spontaneously. I just sit it at the table. I don't have to do anything to it. It's going to melt. So some spontaneous reactions are endothermic. So there's actually more than just energy that we have to look at. There's more than just enthalpy that we have to look at to figure out whether the reaction is going to be spontaneous or not. So there are actually two forces. One of them is that enthalpy idea. And of course, as we said, in terms of enthalpy, the tendency is that exothermic reactions are favored because we're getting more stable, lower in energy. But the other drive that's important is something called entropy. And you have to look at both of these factors um, in the overall reaction to decide if the reaction is going to be spontaneous or not. So what in the world is this entropy thing? And of course, we note our symbols. We've already talked in class that the symbol for enthalpy is H because E is energy, H is enthalpy. And here's another E word yet, 
entropy and of course the symbol for entropy obviously is s what else could it be okay so you just have to remember that that's the symbol for entropy well what exactly is this well we have something called the second law of thermodynamics remember what the first law of thermodynamics said okay second law of thermodynamics says that spontaneous changes like to occur so that there is an increase in entropy okay or in other words that the entropy of the universe is always increasing the change in entropy would always be greater than zero that's what this law says so what in the world is entropy well as you can see in our picture it has to do with the organization of something or i should really say it's the disorganization so when you think of entropy you want to equate it entropy is disorganization the more disorganized something is the more entropy it has Okay, um, so it's kind of a little backwards definition. So here in our picture, you can see I've got a bunch of particles. And so in this case here on the left, my particles are nicely organized. They're packed close together. So um, because this is highly organized, it actually is low in entropy. Because remember, entropy is disorganization. Whereas on this side, we have the same particles, but they're just spread out all over the place. It's much more disorganized. So that means this has a higher disorganization, which means this has a higher entropy. So we want to make sure that we have a good understanding of what um, entropy means. And so another way to think about it, you can think about it as organization, where you kind of think about it, hey, well, the more spread out and spaced out things are, the more disorganized they are. So that means the more entropy they have. So the second law of thermodynamics says that processes tend to want to occur so that the disorganization of the universe increases. Things have a tendency to get more disorganized. You know, think about your bedroom. If you're anything like me, you're proving the second law of thermodynamics every day because you might work really hard to get it nice and organized, but just kind of naturally, without any effort whatsoever, the entropy of your bedroom is constantly increasing and it's getting more and more and more disorganized. That's the second law of thermodynamics. Okay, you can just use that as a little disclaimer. Mom, can't help it. It's just the second law of thermodynamics. Okay. Um, you know, here's just some pictures here. Let's imagine that I have a gas in a vessel. Right now, it's all trapped on this side. I've got this closed. If I were to open up this stopper, the gas would spread out, and I might see something like this. Okay, well, going from here to here, is the entropy increasing or decreasing? Well, it's getting more disorganized. This is more disorganized here. So that means the entropy increased. We would say that delta S is positive going from here to here because the entropy is increasing and that's the natural tendency that's what the second law of thermodynamics tells us you know what are the odds that I would come back two hours later and find this okay that's highly improbable because this is way more organized the chances of that happening are statistically almost impossible um, because of the second law they want to be disorganized so we want to make sure you understand and can compare entropies of things so here's our next uh, question here go ahead and fill this in from highest to lowest entropy all right, hopefully you got these right. I have just some particle views here. They're not in the same order as the pictures are, but you notice um, our ice, of course, you imagine things as a solid, the molecules are lined up. We have high organization here, which means we have low disorganization. So this is actually very low entropy. Whereas the gas form, Things are very spread out, just moving all over the place. Well, this has high disorganization. Okay, and high disorganization, remember, equals high entropy. Just keep repeating to yourself that entropy is the amount of disorganization. The more disorganization, the higher the entropy is. Okay, so our conclusion is, well, depending on the state of things, solids are more organized, so they're going to have the lowest entropy, liquids are in the middle, and then gaseous substances are going to have the highest entropy. Here's another example. Go ahead and tell me who would have the highest entropy, salt crystals or some salt water, salt that's been dissolved in water. Okay, hopefully you are picturing these crystals, again, in this nice organized pattern. And then when we dissolve them, now if it's an ionic compound, it dissociates. So you have all those ions just floating around in here. So obviously thinking about this picture, we are very disorganized. 
compared to very organized over here. And so since this is highly disorganized, that means this has the highest entropy and should be the correct answer of this one. So when we have solutions, when we have things dissolved in water, those dissolved substances are way more spread out, way more disorganized. So therefore, they always have a much higher entropy than the original substances themselves. How about this one? All right, hopefully you got this one correct. If you visualize cold water, those particles moving, compare them with the hot water, a lot more movement. We can think about it that they were a little more spread out. So at a higher temperature, if the same substance, in this case, they're both water, we can definitely say water 50 degrees, um, has more disorganization, therefore higher entropy than water that is at a colder temperature. Okay, next, go ahead and take a look at this and tell me what you say for this one. Okay, so in this one, who's got the highest entropy? Well, there's two ways you can look at this one. Number one, you can look and look at the particles. Where these are very organized, complex particles, these are more disorganized. So one way we can say is that the more complex molecules have more organization, um, therefore they have less entropy. Now, another thing we can look at is talk about how spread out things are. Okay, well, this is in a whole lot more pieces over here than the other one is. So the side of the reaction of the equation that has more total moles is going to be the more spread out. Therefore, it's going to have more entropy than the other side. Okay, so let's put this all together and finalize this. Okay, so we've got a reaction. I want to know, well, will this reaction be spontaneous or not? Well, we know we have to look at two forces. We know that enthalpy is one important force that we have to look at. And we know that enthalpy want things to go so that they are exothermic. It's going to push exothermic reactions forward. Whereas entropy, on the other hand, uh, we want things to be more disorganized. So reactions where entropy is increasing, those those are favored. Entropy wants those kind of reactions to go forward. So let's look at a couple examples. Let's say that I have an exothermic reaction where entropy increases. Will that reaction be spontaneous? Okay, well, as we hopefully answered here, enthalpy says yes, okay, because it's an exothermic reaction. So enthalpy says yes, I want this reaction to go and entropy is increasing, well, the second law of thermodynamics says entropy always increases. So according to entropy, he's also saying yes. So will this reaction be spontaneous? You bet. Anytime you have this kind of reaction, that will always be a spontaneous reaction. It's always going to go. How about this example here? Well, if we look at our two pieces here, enthalpy, well, it's an endothermic reaction. So enthalpy is saying, I like exothermic reactions. So he's saying, no, I do not want this reaction to be spontaneous. And entropy, well, the second law says entropy wants to increase. So entropy is also saying, no, I don't this, want this reaction to be spontaneous. So this type of reaction will never be a spontaneous reaction. It will always be no under any conditions. Both of them are saying, we don't want this to go. So how about this situation? Okay, well, it is endothermic, so that means enthalpy is saying no. Enthalpy likes exothermic reaction, so he's saying no, I don't want it to be spontaneous. But in this case, the entropy is increasing, so entropy is saying yes. So will this be spontaneous? Maybe. If you think about this, it just depends on who's pushing with more force. Is entropy higher or is enthalpy pushing harder? So this could be spontaneous or it could be not spontaneous. It really depends on who's pushing harder. What about this example? Exothermic where entropy is decreasing. Okay, so in this case, since it's exothermic, entropy is saying, yes, I want this reaction to go. And since entropy is decreasing, Entropy says no. So this is another maybe. It depends on who is pushing harder, whether this reaction will go or not. So I want you to go ahead and answer these questions, and we'll check back to see how you did. We want to put a sign, is entropy increasing or decreasing for each of these examples? And then here's four other scenarios. Um, tells you about the enthalpy change and about the entropy change. So we want to put on the line here, will the reaction be spontaneous? Yes, no, or maybe. We'll see how you do on this.